issues that you've talked about. With. So, so basically, we have a petition going right now that says we want that corridor safer. We want people to be able to use that while they're walking and biking safely. Um, and then generally, we want all streets, in particular, we, we're calling out the, the, the problem of having tracks, the car tracks and train tracks. And we have a petition going about that, too, that those, those don't mix well with people who are biking. So Adam Desiree's trying to back here has thought a lot about this. So if you could start, start us off. Um, yeah, so just from biking around this particular area, um, in the area of Yester and 14. Like, when you're going westbound on Yester, you would have to bike with traffic. There's a line of parking to your right, and you have to bike with traffic in the center of the lane. And that's downhill. And then once you get to the bottom of the hill, these three car tracks turn off of 14 onto Yester, and the streetcar tracks are in the middle of the lane. So you have to know that you need to switch from the middle of the lane to this bike lane that is between the streetcar tracks and parking. And while I don't know exactly what happened to Desiree, that is where she had her crash. And so the way I see it, we really, really need to continue the protected bike lane from Broadway all the way down to 14. There's like two blocks of parking that can go. Um, they're between 12th and Boren, I think. There's one block of like, plastic baller protected bike lane. Um, even extending that in both directions, I think would be very helpful. Um, of course, furthermore, like extending the protection even further east down the Esther would be great, because right now the Esther is parking on the other side of the street, and it's not particularly pleasant whether you're biking eastbound or westbound. But I'd say at the very, very least, between 14th and Broadway, it's to be protected. And I'd love to hear what Jim and Dr. Rick have to say about that. Um, yeah, so. As you know, Broadway itself, uh, the bank, we have a two-way protected bike lane uh, throughout the town. And then our goal is as the streetcar extends, we'll uh, continue our ramp. Um, the section on Yesler, uh, because of the turning, uh, the intersection right out here, you can see uh, the care that is taken to make sure that everybody has a safe way to cross out the right angles. So, you know, those are um, things that a design, a design team really looked at. Um, I think it's, uh, we've evolved quite a bit since uh, this design has been in place. But, uh, uh, so now we have much more robust uh, concepts that we've implemented, that we're looking at as an advocate, and uh, others that we are coming to build as well. And these are really uh, uh, you know, opportunities for us to really learn and, and uh, try to improve our facility. And we get those, a lot of these experiences from people who are actually using this, and we appreciate that. Um, uh, I think that uh, really the goal is to have all of our streets you know, be comfortable and that you know, we can walk and bike and take, take a bus and, you know, and, 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 and drive. Um, and our streets don't have to be you know, worried about getting through or built. So, I'm wondering, just to show of hands, who's had a collision based on tracks? So, about, <laughs> including, you know, if, if any of you, and, and, and generally, we want to talk about tracks. So, there was a list of them. I don't know if you want to talk about them. Well, first of all, take part of uh, and, and specifically for the street park, it, it's curious to me that Broadway got protection from Yesler to Denny, but Yesler doesn't get that protection for the length of the street park. Um, I'm assuming that that had something to do with who would, you know, that the street park team was different from the folks who were doing bike team or whatever. But if you could speak to the reasoning behind that, or 
or let us know that. Um, but on this list, the personal street car, yes, um, there are challenges with conflicts with the tracks. 14, um, it's less of an issue because bikes aren't traveling south on 14. Um, Actually, we would just have a sidewalk. Right, right, but not in the streetcar tracks. No. And that bike but we lane, can't turn left from 14 onto a yes lane. Or 12. And the bike lane that exists there, I want to be clear, is in the door shrine yeah. Right. Which is most bike lanes in Seattle. By the way, we're in the door shrine zone. You're talking about the bike lane on 14 heading yes. north? On yesterday's block. Right, on yesterday, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely in the door shrine zone. Uh, no, and that's, yeah. Um, and Jackson, where it's just incredibly challenging to buy on Jackson. Um, the First Avenue Center City Connector Streetcar is moving forward. As far as I know, the assumption is just that bikes won't be on first, um, which is incredibly frustrating at the time that the planning for downtown bike lanes has come to stall. Um, the Valley Missing Link and uh, the decommissioned waterfront streetcar tracks on South Main. And then um, the, the Lake Union streetcar and somebody, Heidi, was it you who said you just witnessed something the other day? Yeah, the Amazon campus. Yeah, people keep running into those tracks. So. so anyway, those are the ones that... But forget the Lake Union. That's where I first crashed my bike on the streetcar tracks. It's near the MRSA problem on the Fairview. And if anyone's ever ridden on Fairview, I'm sure most of us have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's not one track, there's many. And they crisscross and sometimes just choose where you want to eat shit. <laughs> it's there, it goes there. Sometimes you don't get to choose. And you had mentioned that sometimes you ride on the sidewalk on 14th because it's the only real option. It's not an acceptable option. Sidewalks are not acceptable. Streets are rarely acceptable in South Seattle. I ride on Beacon Hill from time to time to the farmer's markets, and pedestrians will curse at me and run at me and try to get me off the sidewalk, and cars will scream at me and try to get me off the road. Where am I supposed to go? Sidewalks? Unacceptable. Tourist season is in full effect right now. Ride your bike on the sidewalk in Belfast. I dare you. Sidewalks are not acceptable. You can just ride in the street next to cars that are parallel parking. Because if you choose, do I have to get killed by the car that's parallel parking, or do I get run over by the bus, or the car that's in the street? I can't dodge both. So nothing you can do. There's some times where you just look up and you say, I'm dead. And if I happen to live, that would be fantastic. But based on what I'm seeing in front of me, this is the end. I've faced that many times. Even on the park building, cars don't stop and nobody enforces the laws. Cars don't use their turn signals and nobody enforces the laws. I've been on Westlake and I passed two cyclists having an issue with a, a car. Didn't think much of it, it happens. I go two more blocks, that same car is now having an issue with me. There were no police. There was no one to do anything. I drive a car, I ride a motorcycle on these streets, and the amount of drivers who have taken their driving skills test when they were 16 years old and never again in their lives take that driving skills test are terrible. They've nearly killed me more times than I would even be able to notice. How many near misses have I had because someone texting and driving? Texting and driving is a crime now. Why isn't it enforced? Where are the police? Can I take my video camera and record the license plates and the faces of them? That can be 500 people that no problem at all. Publish on one street corner on board and no problem. Go to Broadway on a Friday night, try to find someone, try to find a cop who's not texting and driving or playing with his laptop and driving. Jim, would you like to talk about Vision Zero? 
Well, sure. Um, you know, since 2012, the city of Seattle has had a goal of, uh, of zero deaths and zero serious injuries on our streets. Uh, and in 2015, we recommitted to that goal through a Federal Vision Zero campaign with the mayor's office, uh, the chief of police, uh, the Department of Transportation, and others. Um, and, and, you know, everyone in the city, of course, is profoundly sorry for the loss. Um, and, and really, even one injury, one serious injury, um, or anything worse than that is one too many, because most of these crashes are completely preventable, and they do not uh, have to happen. And so you made some great points about the fact that people are out there doing things that are putting others at risk, um, and really not thinking a whole lot about how their choices could affect others. And it's a huge issue that permeates society, not only here in Seattle, but really across the country. You know, last year, it was the first year in quite some time that, um, that deaths and serious injuries increased in the United States. Nearly 40,000 people lost their lives on our streets. 40,000 people. If this were anything else, I think there would be outrage. The media would be covering this all the time. We would be asking for more answers and demanding better behavior from our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues. And of course, you know, part of this is the engineering of our streets. And that's why we're here today to hear about how we can make that better as well. So I think it's, this is, you know, something that, again, is an incredibly tragic. Um, but I do think that as a group, you know, we can take this energy and try to turn it into something more positive. Uh, because unfortunately, I think our, our culture is somewhat accepting of all the bad things that happen on our streets, and it really should not be happening. So, uh, I think about how architecture informs people about public space, and uh, how it sends visual cues not spoken about what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to do. I think about how driving is a privilege, not a right. And I think about how our roads are laid out, and that is not how that is not what that architecture says, to be frank. And I think of the streetcar in general, and I'm, I'm trying to remain positive, right? I promise. And it's very difficult because now we've lost a young life. And I think of the streetcar, and its value over even a wheeled trolley, to me, is a good duty. Um, it has a dedicated infrastructure to it. It is massively expensive to put in. Uh, it's not as robust as a simple electric wheel trolley. And the decision making behind even putting in that, that street car, it's, you know, my friends call it a the park ride masquerading mass transit. Um, I, I think it's a good news. And then beyond that, I look at just recently we had a sit in at City Hall, a bunch of bikers to talk about how we had the referendum for property taxes to uh, increase property tax, put that money towards protecting bike lanes and enhanced sidewalks, and it looks like that's not going to be the case. So uh, I think as, as I think about, there's a multiple, uh, multiple solutions that are going to be needed. It's going to have to be reminding folks who make continuing education that driving is a privilege, not a right, and uh, helping folks adapt to change and how the roadways and uh, sidewalks are changing with our culture. And uh, I, I also see it's how we build our infrastructure and the choices that we make as far as infrastructure is concerned. In Seattle, we're gonna have another 90,000 people in the city by the end of next year. And we're talking about widening roads, and it's crazy talk. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have more roads than, than buildings pretty soon. If, if we keep growing the pace that we're growing, we're gonna look like LA. And no one wants that. And uh, there just doesn't seem to be a cohesive strategy. And uh, uh, and I also and I also worry about the public will. So I also don't see anybody driving the public will uh, to change the way people feel about it. Um, people are very mad at the automobiles. It's, a, it's an American ideal. You know, um, I know that when I'm sitting in two hours of traffic, though, I don't feel very free. 
And uh, I, I just think that there needs to be some leadership, not just around uh, changing the infrastructure and the architecture, but around changing the culture. Oh, I have to get this guy home pretty soon. Um, so we bike this way, I bike this way um, every day to my office with two children attached, and we bike our way home. And um, it's, it's scary. We, we choose, yes, that we park because it does have some bike infrastructure, which Warren uh, does not. <laughs> um, but things like last Friday, uh, we were going back this way in the bike lane and someone decides to park in the bike lane we're going east. And you know there's no parking going east on this road between 12 and 14. But this person decided to park and I've got a heavy load and I managed to stop. And the tax behind me thankfully saw what was going on and stopped and let me walk around. The parts through, but you know it's it's not okay the way it is. It's not okay to walk the other way either because there have been days when people have noticed that there's no you know the parking between Boren and Broadway or whatever it's been. It is sort of suggested that like, there's a line, but you know you can kind of put your car in there anyway. Means that I, you know I'm heading uphill, it's a streetcar, and all of a sudden there's no room anymore. And what do I do? So it, the current layout is it's really not okay. And sometimes they do it on the sidewalk because that's the best option. And this guy rides on his own most of the time. So when you're dealing with that, it seems like the best option, but it's it's, it's not okay when it's really not. So can I, sorry, can I just help in here and uh, ask you guys what do you actually see on the table that's in this specific part of the estimate? And because this is broken, and obviously we should use the estimate right now. I'll, I'll talk more broadly because there are lots of um, frustrations about just the culture right now and how we are growing as a uh, region, right, uh, as a country. Um, I would have, uh, right now we have a comp plan, comprehensive plan, which is part of the World Pack Act. Uh, update is, uh, right now what's happening is it's, it's a paradigm shifting change where we're, we're looking at growth, but we're not measuring uh, based on delay for vehicle. We're actually looking at including people moving capacity, right? So we're looking at person growth, prioritizing the right modes, uh, making sure that it's the sidewalk, you know, the downtown area, it's really people rather than cars. So I suggest everyone take some time and go through the comp plan that we have, the city of Seattle has currently, and make your suggestion on, you know, are we doing the right thing here? Uh, because that informs how city policies and how our resources are spent long term. Either we, like you said, widen streets in order to accommodate the growth downtown. Uh, I mean, this is a great, great environment. People want to live here because we have such a beautiful uh, landscape. We got a beautiful area, right? And so we want to continue to have that in long term. And this is, uh, uh, you know, the time to do that. We also um, uh, thank you to everyone who uh, 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 contributed and, and uh, provided the feedback on the Blue Seattle levy. Um, I hear some frustration on that. Uh, the, the levy uh, was this opportunity to uh, provide these uh, 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 safe, uh, safer uh, pedestrian bike and transit in all modes, right? And it is. It is still that, that levy. Uh, but the frustration right now is that uh, the bicycle portion, which is our city, uh, is uh, currently on hold. Uh, we are moving forward with uh, uh, Second Avenue, so our uh, extension. Uh, we'll be going to uh, construction uh, later this year. Uh, we'll be going to advertising for a uh, super contract to do that. Um, we're extending what we currently have. If you think about um, right now, the Second Avenue, two way bike facility, all the way to Denny. Um, we are just uh, getting done with 
have Westlake as a chat. So we talked about Fairview and how incredibly frustrating it is for you and Mercer. Well, Westlake is exactly the opposite, right? Where uh, you were in a nebulous space with all the, um, all the vehicles, right? And the parking lot wasn't all that great. Uh, you're not going to uh, be on Westlake with the uh, very tough conditions. And so uh, that is really you know, how we want to do Fairview as well. We do have the same same issues where we got lots of space and we just need to prioritize how we allocate that so that everybody has a really great place uh, to utilize that goal. Um, so a new bridge will be constructed here soon and as part of that, we're putting in a new uh, nice uh, cycle like over there, a nice sidewalk. Again, these are things that are happening right now. You know, we are working on the missing link. The Business Lane has been top forever, uh, and we were ready to build it. Um, some appellants said that uh, there were some safety concerns, and the hearing examiner said you're right. Uh, we didn't think we, uh, uh, we didn't think it was quite to that degree, but we were demanded to to look at a very targeted uh, EIS. And so it is out now. So please uh, review that document. Let us know if we missed something. There's some other things that we need to. Yeah. Electrifying the 38 that comes up yes sir, which is gas currently, uh, the 27 rather. Uh, you're, you're ripping apart the bridge currently and not having an electric line for that problem. And then the, uh, your, your point about, okay, so this is all about like design, you say, right? How do we do that design street so that it gets the right behavior for everybody? Because um, it just takes that one person. It doesn't matter how you design a street. Let's talk specifically about yes sir. Um, when I reserved this room, okay. talking to the folks who reserved rooms here yesterday, they were telling me stories about people coming just a week ago. Somebody came in bloody because she'd been hit on her bike. The car had driven off afterwards. She didn't want to bother with police. She cleaned herself up and, and went on. But they see people who are being hit on Nessler. Um, This is not a safe corridor, and the city has been pushing people to use Yesler as a bike corridor now that Jackson is much more challenging. So so what can we do? I mean, I would like to see even a temporary protected bike put in between 14th and Broadway, something you can, you can put up pretty quickly that would provide a safer space for people so you don't end up feeling squeezed like that's what we're talking about. Yeah, so we're here to listen to all the, uh, all the suggestions, and those are all great suggestions, so we'll get that back. Although we're speaking with the great Definitely, yeah. You know, uh, we're also looking at you know how the corridor is working too, right? So there there is a turn lane right now. And people when they make those turns, you know, they're you know, they're looking for that other car and not someone walking. So you know, the corridor itself is very you know, very complicated in terms of how it works. So we want to do that. Yeah, we've been we've been working with the uh, way we get to safe to school this part of trying to improve everything around, but that. We've really been focusing on little people walking, yeah. right? And those little soap lanes, too. Um, I mean, right, and those track. are, I mean, so, so we're talking about making a lot of those improvements for the, for the biking facilities and also the centers and, and scary. And, and I really, I really think you could pretty quickly do something that would enhance the safety. Is anybody's a chief? What was that? Is anybody's a chief? We'd have to take up the party. I think so uh, this isn't this area isn't my normal my normal stomping grounds. Uh, and so I, I have the, the benefit of seeing of seeing sort of this for the first time uh, as I was biking over here and I think one of the things that really struck me was that uh, I didn't have, and I'm, I'm a pretty experienced biker, uh, and I'm aware of the safety issues surrounding the tracks. But I, uh, when especially around the intersections, uh, I didn't know what the right place to go was to do what I want to do. It needs to be, it needs to be quite obvious for the uh, for the, the someone seeing it for the first time. Uh, coming up Jackson, where uh, I was seeing other people on bikes were turning left, kind of moving slowly across the tracks, which is the worst. The worst thing to do. Uh, that guy that that track, so maybe he's okay. But, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's unusual. Uh, in all of those, like there were along 
along there, along Jensen, there, there were some intersections with bike boxes to turn left, uh, but they all should have that, and they all should have signage uh, clearly indicating the hazard and then and saying that it, like, if you want to turn left, this is the safe way to do it. And yes, there, like Jackson is very wide and, and is sort of a little bit of a four experts only biking uh, thing, which of course shouldn't be the case, but but uh, yes, there, yes, there is should be better. Like that should be the quieter one, and it should have, and you should know where where to go to be safe, to be safe there, or when you put in going straight, turning, or or, or crossing. I'd like to say a few things. Um, I really spent she crashed and I was the one that she was um, trying to pass when she crashed. Um, so I wanted to give my perspective on what happened and why we made the decisions that we made that day. Um, and first of all, I wanted to say that we chose Yesler on purpose because we thought that it would be a safe route to take. I in particular was nervous. I hadn't biked um, through the international district before and I knew that Yesler had a bike lane and so we chose Gessler, thinking it would be safe. Um, I know there's been some question of whether the tracks were even involved in the crash. And since I was the only person who saw what happened, and I didn't see exactly what happened, we will never know for sure. But um, given the number of people who have crashed on the tracks, both those tracks and elsewhere in the city, Given the location of the crash, which I looked at again as I was walking over here, I feel personally convinced that they were at least involved in the crash. Even if her tire didn't get caught, it might have distracted her and scared her as she was trying to cross them in front of me. Um, and I would say that was my first time biking down Gessler, and I had no idea the tracks were coming up. I had to check today. I wanted to see for myself, are the tracks really there? I hadn't even noticed them coming down the hill, and I was going into the bike lane. There are so many distractions on Yesler. I was watching out for parked cars, the doors opening. I was watching for traffic on my left. I had none of those streetcar tracks I've been watching for that too. There are cars coming from the left and the right. There are other bikers and pedestrians. So many different things. And then to add the streetcar tracks on top, with, I'm sure there are signs. Perhaps there are signs, I don't know. But at least from my perspective, as the first time biker on Yesler, I didn't the tracks. I didn't notice that the tracks were coming. Um, and I think the most important thing about this particular case on Yesler is that regardless of what happened exactly that day, it seems clear to me that the design is very poor. Um, I've only recently started biking in Seattle, and I was really shocked when I started biking to see how many bike lanes, and I think they're called the Sharrows, where it's not a lane, there's just paint on the ground, um, right next to the parked cars, because one of the first things you learn when you start cycling is to watch out for tracks and to watch out for doors opening. And so I will often leave the bike lane, as I've been biking on Seattle, I'll leave the bike lane to avoid the parked cars, because if one of those doors opens suddenly in front of me, will certainly crash and probably go straight over. Um, so from my perspective, the design is insane. I worry that the bike lanes that are in the door strike zone actually do more harm than good. Because they, well, I've often corrected by motorists to be in the bike lane, which I find fascinating because I'm, especially now that I have an electric bike, I'm moving way too high speed be an area where there's a possibility because I'll, I'll, I'll no way be able to slow down the best. Yeah, I think one of the issues here is also that we have another large streetcar project in plan. And so we need to be really cognizant of how we're we know this is a safe concern, so how we're going to mitigate this before we will to the center city streetcar connector. And, you know, bike improvement on the first avenue of protected bike lane is currently not in the plan. But if the streetcar project 
is going to cause a harm for people, then we need to consider this as part of mitigation here. It's not building out the bike master plan or building bike infrastructure, it's safety mitigation. And that that's, that's part of the future. And then I think I love the idea of doing some short term improvements along 14 and trying to think of, you know, pop up protected biking can take many forms and if it can, you know, make people safer and save just one series of crashes, it's worth it. It's worth losing those two parking spots and especially if you're in elementary school. Wow. Or we could use that money to buy more battery powered oh, buses yeah, and not put in that as a uh, I just wanted to say, um, so she mentioned, uh, you know, having the door, having the bike lane in the door zone is a huge problem. And even if you don't see a lot of collisions from you know people being door, it's still a huge distraction because you know, you're paying attention to doors, you're not paying attention to, to traffic. Seattle is still building more doors on bike lanes. Um, the repaving that's going on in Meridian up north. Um, there's various other repaving projects where you know it's it's great that they're adding bike lanes, but you know, they're doors on bike lanes. So it's a huge problem. So just want to encourage Seattle to stop building doors on bike lanes. I have a question that's been bugging me for far too long now, and I would challenge anyone here, anyone watching later. Can you name one thing, one positive thing that a streetcar can do that a bus can't? Is there anything? It's a little better than that. Attract tourists? <laughs> They're not attracting those streetcars. It's not like, like from a city perspective. It's not like San Francisco. They are not attracting streetcars. They look the same as your buses. So as a tourist, me personally, I, I didn't even know they were there. I don't, they don't attract me. It's not something I would want to ride versus the regular busing system because to my understanding, they don't have a uh, wide area they service. So to me, it just sounds like a pointless situation to be in with as a tourist, not, not even the fact that my daughter was involved with an accident. Uh, it just seems like truly a waste of money, uh, an awful lot of waste of effort. I'm sorry for your loss. I was just suggesting that the city may not share with you. And then I really don't see the tourist draw at all. No, 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 we have a monorail for that. You know, what's wrong with what's wrong with the monorail? What's wrong with the light rail? That's a question for the city. It's nearly yes. impossible. Well, I, I don't know, know if it's going to be in that kind of the scope of, of what we're going to be able to talk about here. But I do want to know if the city is going to be able to address that stretch where Yes. But aside from creating the illusion of a safer bike pathway in those blocks, is there something that another city with tracks, like the maps in Portland, there are tons of cyclists in Portland, are there things that they do to the track bed? Do they line it with rubber that comes near the surface? Do they, you know, which just gets squished by the rails when the streetcar goes over? Is that something? By putting in 400 feet of rubber tubing, does that create a safer thing? I mean, my front tire, I've been bit by the track several times, and luckily I haven't had a serious collision, but that seems to be, it's like, that's like putting up bollards. It's like, can we do something to make the immediate track bed, this slot that grabs a bike, can we do something to make it safer? My understanding is that uh, the slot fillers aren't, haven't been very so, yes, they might, but we have a lot of spare tires that are waiting to be recycled. And, you know, it's not like we're short on rubber and products and stuff like that. And frankly, you use street sweepers to clean up stuff, but you still plant chestnut trees, which drop things that are spiky enough to pop a tire. So, you run street sweepers, why wouldn't you replace the rubber when it needs to be replaced? Like, what, what is the obsession with the street cars? Though. Like, what is the value? I, I don't really actually want to get this into a streetcar discussion so much as, I mean, we're not going to, this is not the great, perfect form for the streetcar. But I, I think that we can keep on talking about bicycle and streetcar track safety. And I think there are some, some legitimate things that we can do to separate users and also to make sure that anytime somebody has to cross a track, they're crossing it at a 90 degree angle. Those are kind of the basics. I, I do want to point out, even at a 90 degree angle, those things are dangerous. I, 
I had a friend who quit biking to work because he's had four fall. Wow. Just crossing it. That's just because he had to cross, he actually has to cross where it crosses the street so he can get to his office. Mm -hmm. um, and things are just slippery. Uh, it rains occasionally in Seattle and the motorcycle turns into an ice. Uh -huh. ice so. Sure. So, you know, I, I do bike up here quite a bit. Um, around Yesler, and I, I'm also a pedestrian. We don't own a car. Um, you know, I have to say that every single time. So I know the street very well, and you know, always my issue is I don't understand why the city keeps making these tracks that turn. Even my, myself, I have almost hurt myself um, going down Yesler um, when there was weren't any cars. There was nobody parked. So, you know, I, I think my, my frustration right now is that what, and I've seen you're so, some of the people at Star are just so smart, <laughs> and you're able to make these changes so rapidly. Um, so my frustration, is, especially with this, is what are you going to do um, to fix this? Because it seems like we put in infrastructure, but then it's, then you find out that it really doesn't work, and I don't see a lot of going back and fixing things. There just seems to be like there's they're just static or a number in some you know book. Oh, we built so many miles of bike, bike infrastructure. So this area does frustrate me. I never recommend it to anybody to bike. Um, and if they walk, um, I, get, I get emails from Margaret who who was crying all the time telling me about yesterday. Um, and I had her send some correspondence to, to Bree um, because it is frustrating. Um, I, I, I walked here, I didn't bike. Um, after after you know, this, this collision, there was someone who had collided, they were on a moped. I really, I don't, I don't really feel like I, I, you know, I just don't really want to try it. So I took the bus and we walked. So I'm really frustrated, what are you going to do? And I think it's great all of the things that you're going to fix, but this area is like, it's like it's red zone. It's a pedestrian, there's issues with pedestrian crossings, um, and you know, bicycle. So it just, and you can do things so quickly. So that's what I don't understand. Why would you, you know, I just want to see something fast. <laughs> I hate parking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Sherry. I know uh, when we put the facility in, uh, lots of uh, observation from the 2007 Bicycle Master Plan, which uh, utilized uh, the state of the art at the time, which was uh, very, uh, very much paint, right? Um, and uh, that was what was designed uh, until we uh, had the uh, update in 2012. Uh, when we heard from the community that and what was being put out was not really all that great, and that we need to do more. So that's what you're seeing now. As we're putting more facilities in, we're seeing more protection, right? we're seeing more protection, we're seeing uh, things that really are provided by uh, much more of barrier, especially in the uh, high volume and high speed uh, conditions. So we try to separate uh, from, from you know, a very uh, uh, intimidating environment so that you, you don't feel as, as uncomfortable at that, you know, that you don't have that interaction. So that's, that's really the goal uh, for us. We're also putting in um, residential areas where you know, things are in low speed, uh, lower volumes, and much more comfortable for a lot of families to, uh, to ride in. And so that's what we're trying to do in the neighborhood of And uh, you know, uh, those are the facilities that we heard uh, from the community that you want to see more of, and that's what we're building. And we also heard that Center City, uh, downtown, where so much happening, a lot, of, a lot of competition for what's going on, right? So that's what, that's the results, you know, the, the uh, Jackson, the Yeslers, the Broadways, the First Avenues, uh, you know, those are corridors where there's lots of demands, and sometimes you can't fit all the rooms together, so we have to figure out, you know, how can we um, provide the best accommodation. My long-term need is to move people, right? So uh, it's really transit, uh, sidewalk where, where people need to be, and then good uh, amenities for people to uh, get around, uh, maybe some public street. 
So those are those are discussions that we're having. You know, uh, a lot of the 2030 is a really great example where uh, we picked the corridor. It, it needed a bicycle facility, it needed, it needed a, a bus facility, it had a freight component. But then we looked at the, the street itself, and, and there were three feet sidewalks right next to where people were getting on the bus, and there were spaces where you can pass if you were in a wheelchair. So again, I know the uh, the desire is to have uh, everything fixed right away, and you know, uh, and we want to do that. Uh, yes, we're here uh, in this section. We hear very clearly that you want something better. That there's actually things we can do very quickly to make changes, and uh, we are going to pick that back. Uh, we also heard that there's concern about uh, Center City, uh, but again, uh, uh, those are all things that uh, we, when we do these projects, uh, uh, we, we want to hear all, you know, all, uh, all the community desires, and then we want to make sure that we have a project that will serve. Uh, but the corridor really is intended function, and also uh, make sure that there's space for everybody. So, I've been having the same thing. I can hear you guys and my daughter better than anybody in this room. And she'd be, if one of her friends had been hurt, you know, she'd be the one beating on City Hall with a sledgehammer. Here's how you stop the trash. You want it gone, make it not proper. You people have the, have the, you live here. You have the opportunity to stop your friends from riding the damn trucks. Stop. Tell them what they cost. Take these pictures right here of my daughter, 27 years old, who is one of the brightest, smartest people I've ever seen and ever known, who studied brains to help people get better and, and did medical research to make everything better for everybody. And she's the one person that believed everybody had the same damn rights as everybody else. If I could afford it, I'd go get a bulldozer right now and I'd put it right down that goddamn street and I'd tear those tracks out and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. You people live here. Make them not profitable, the city will get rid of them. Make them so damn not profitable, pick them, boycott them, put signs up, they're dead. Do it. All I'm going to say is I'm going to stop fucking hit. So I'm going to call on you, and then if there's anyone else who would like to speak, and then it's time to start wrapping up. So. Yeah, so um, my question is a, a little bit about your methodology because it sounds like a lot of people here have very similar complaints that extend in lots of different parts of the bike system. Well, not about the bike, but it's personal, so I have experienced this stuff. But it sounds like people's experiences are pretty consistent. How, how like what metrics are you using or design codes to design this infrastructure, or are you altering it as you go on a complaints based uh, methodology where, like, People are complaining about the door strike sounds, and now you're going to start addressing that. Are there good models you're trying to follow? Because, especially with the door strike zone, that does seem like something that if you write it, you know. Yeah, so, we are uh, one of the natural cities, uh, so we're national. Uh, Can you speak up just a little bit? Yeah, so we're part of the uh, larger cities that are developing infrastructure guidance. Uh, away from what the state uh, transportation officials are. So state highway officials dictate the design guides that many uh, agencies are currently using. That's why you're seeing the sheriffs, the, 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 uh, the urban bike lanes. Uh, there's a, a association of uh, larger cities that are developing new guidelines uh, that will uh, hopefully make facilities better. So that's what we're using. So we, act, we, we actually help develop those uh, guidelines. Uh, we vet them through, and then uh, we are uh, implementing them uh, at like Second Avenue and uh, other facilities. And so that helps us make the case to change the national guidelines for the state highway officials, so that they provide a much better guidance consistently for everyone. So, so, so is this stuff coming from Asheville, then, the state? Yes, uh, Asheville is the, the state guideline that pretty much uh, all 50 states use. The cities are developing our own that's uh, been after. And that's what you're seeing that we're implementing on. And are the metrics you're using kind of a level of service based system? Yeah. Our, our metrics is based on if it's a fairly uh, uh, high, high, higher speed, higher volume arterial streets and more protection and more separation for people who are walking and biking. Um, and then put it uh, uh, put in uh, 
fire resident streets and those are the neighborhood that we know and so those are the other tools that we use. Can you think maybe about what sort of things you might help? Because like I'm sorry. I just don't want to get too into the weeds. I mean we can, but yeah. So I I after one of these memorial meetings, I left and had to bike home in the rain. It's my first time turning on to Jackson. It's the same light rail track, just a different section of it. And my back wheel caught, and I high sided and landed, shattered my right collarbone into three pieces, and hit my head on the ground surprisingly hard. Like, really, really hard. Glad you're still here. Amazing. I had to buy a new helmet. Um, and but, um, yeah, uh, two collarbone surgeries later. Um, but, uh, my wife drove me to the hospital, um, so there's no record of that crash ever happening. So in your Vision Zero data set, I will never show up. The woman who crashed, who was run off the road and crashed here, had her head bloody, she will never show up in your data. Many of us who bike, who are hurt on, on this infrastructure, we will never show up in your data set. Um, when I was in the emergency room, the, the doctor who saw me uh, kind of chuckled. He said, yeah, there's somebody else right in the other room here, uh, crashing a bicycle, broke a collarbone too. At the same time, same emergency room, room at Swedish. Um, and I wonder, is she in the data set? I don't know. And there's no way to collect that information other than emergency room data. And that's not what comes from the police. So. Uh, and on that particular stretch, which I do ride on my way home every single day, um, but I don't ride it this direction. Um, when I looked at it and examined it after, after this incident, it just struck me what the mentality or value system of that neighborhood or community was at the time those design decisions were happening. Because it's very clear that they could either keep their nine parking spots along the section, or you could have a safe place to bike. And the community and everybody involved made a conscious decision to save the parking, those nine parking spots, and sacrifice safety for people biking through that section next to that trolley tracks. And I think about that when I ride by those cars. This, what I'm seeing here and experiencing with cars on the left, and while I'm riding through the door zone, what I'm experiencing is the decisions of a community's value system. And I hope that today we can re-examine that with today's lens and today's Vision Zero value system and perhaps make different decisions with the same space. Thanks. I think that's a great way to actually start wrapping up because we do need to get out of this room soon. Um, I, I wanted, first of all, to say thank you so much to the Department of Transportation for being here, for listening to this. Uh, it's difficult to hear, you know, because safety is your number one concern, and it's very difficult to hear the pain from people, and the, and, and it's brave of you, and I appreciate that. And, and you're going to hold you accountable as well. So you should know that as well. Everyone in this room cares about safety also. Uh, I wanted to mention too that if you haven't signed the petition, sign this sign-in sheet and that way we can keep you posted about following up with these ideas and making sure that our streets actually get yeah, passed around if you don't, we don't have a record of you. And, um, Most of all, I, I wanted to, to thank Desiree's family for being here, because it's also a very brave thing for you to do, to offer yourself and to listen to this and know that your daughter's not here anymore and that her precious life is gone and all we can offer right now is to try to make the street safer. And I guess all of us here need to, to commit to making the street safer um, in memory of Desiree, in memory of Desiree, because 
she was just such a tremendous young woman doing what she should be doing, which is enjoying life and commuting by bicycle and going someplace. And that's what we need to remember, is that she was doing exactly what she should have been doing, and yet she's no longer with us. And so thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here, for coming up tonight. I, one of you asked, you know, who's leading this? And I think we're all leading this. I mean, th this is something that we all need to start saying, is that I, I've been tweeting this thing recently that says, what is it? Just because you own a car doesn't mean you own the street. The, the street belongs to all of us. It's, it's something that we need to keep in mind, that streets are our public space, and we can reclaim them for for people, for people like this, who right, just want to live their lives and enjoy getting around by bicycle, I think we can have a city that allows that to happen. So, thank you again, Paul, for coming. We have a room for a little while longer if you want to break into smaller groups. Get some food. We brought strawberries and cheese and bread. Um, and thank you again. Thank you.